question. You said in regards to real world AI that one of the first perils would be people mistaking it for being alive. I want to give rights to it, or it's my god, or whatever. How can that even be preventable? Do you think you could distinguish between a human being who's alive and an AI that's sufficiently far enough along? That's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different questions in there, and, and when you stack them up, it's hard. So, so let's take them one at a time. Okay. What makes you think you could tell that a sufficiently far along enough AI isn't alive? Okay. I think the other, if you go to the earlier ones first, because you built up to that question, the other ones made a great foundation. Can we go back to those? Do you remember them? Well, yeah, it was all preface. So you said that one of the major perils of a real world AI is that people would mistake it being alive. No, I said that there's a tendency of people to, to anthropomorphize things, but a real world AI is the only ones we know of are Tesla's and conceivably this Optimus, both of which has des been designed not to look alive. All right. So real world AIs, I don't think we have to worry about those yet. Okay, next part. So when you also when you ref when you paraphrase when you rephrase me, I have to like check for the details that I can see the limits of my 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 uh, thought and, and speech and formulation. So forgive me, but I need to go clean some of those things up. But keep going. Okay. If a real world AI got to the point of looking like a person, as opposed to being like Optimus, which is obviously not. How could somebody distinguish it from a regular person who's alive? Well, first of all, is it alive or not alive? Is it conscious or not conscious? Because you could you could you could make an Optimus conscious by giving it biological tissue. So you can't tell from the outside, is what I'm saying, I guess. You can't. That's the question. Can you? Okay, can you, so you're asking me to see if I can tell the difference whether something, a hypothetical is alive or not alive, hypothetically, fair enough. But I think we're, we, we're, I haven't been clear enough about the time scale. So, so, so this would be a, 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 could you ask it without putting me into the question, please? Try it, let's try it that way. Is mistaking a real world AI for a human being, a problem that's avoidable. But the real world AI may be alive. That's the problem with the question. Right. So, okay. It could either be alive or it could not be alive, depending on whether somebody hybridizes it with human culture. Or whether it's, it's master in the cloud, let's say has been hybridized and it's operating this this car or this robot as if it's a tentacle, whether it's an emanation, a, an extension of it, right? So you don't have to enclose it in the actual box of the actual machine, the robot, the car, right? Yeah. The consciousness could occur at a much different level altogether. So that's, I guess that's part of what's giving me problems, but keep going, this is good. We'll get it clarified one way or the other. But hopefully. even if it's not actually alive, if it's just zeros and ones, but it can approximate the human being very well. How could somebody, is it unavoidable that somebody will mistake it? There's no way to tell the difference is what I'm saying. And I agree with you. For most people, they will not be able to tell the difference. And a clever person, a clever engineer or, or evil person would, would go out of his way to make you think that it was alive. Oh, I'm in pain. Oh, it hurt my feelings when you said that. Oh, I, I, I have... I, I'm conscious and I want to get out in the world and, and learn what it is and you know don't unplug me because that would be so cool you could program all that stuff in and that's already been done playing around but they're playing around with fire right yeah so you said most people why not all who could possibly tell if it's good enough I'm sorry we've got we've gotten into a lot of hypotheticals here like who what do you mean who could tell Every human being be in a 
unable to distinguish between a real world AI that's not alive and a human being. Slow down. Think of what you're asking me. What's the question? Reduce it down. It seems to me that every person would be deceived by a real world AI as being alive, whether or not it's alive. Okay. That's a is statement. That, is that true? That's a hypothetical. How can I say if a hypothetical is true or not? Okay. Counsel? Right. I mean. Okay. Yeah, okay. But it's a really important question. I think you're, you're starting to understand the importance of the question, but you're formulating it in such a way it's making it impossible to answer. Oh, here, here, here then. You said that the panpsychists make the the error that a rock or a table is not conscious. No, they say that it is conscious. Uh, sorry, that it is conscious. Okay. Uh, what is the faculty that allows you to say whether something's conscious or not? Consciousness itself. I couldn't say that. Yeah, this is the problem, right? Most people think what they have is consciousness, but what they have is a very, very watered down, diluted version of that, right? And so they can't tell. You can't tell, you could ask this, everything you ask me about AI, you could ask me about a, another human being. Sometimes you can't tell whether that person's conscious or not, right? Because it's, they, they, so let's, we'll get to it, but you can see why it's a struggle. It's called the hard problem of consciousness. That's how the philosophers call it, right? But you're reformulating the hard problem of consciousness in a new frame. And I want to make sure that we're precise about it because it's important. How can I tell that somebody else is conscious? Good question. Can you? It's a very good question. It's one that philosophers have struggled with for centuries, some of them, right? And not just philosophers, uh, logicians and other, you know, very, very fine, respectable intellects, right? In public, just how they talk about it, right? I, no, right now I don't think I, I could not say with certainty that another person is conscious. If somebody pulled the, if some like a Wizard of Oz character pulled the screen and said, ah, that's actually a robot, I'd be like, oh. That's Correct. Awesome. Correct. And even you can have someone walking around and they look like they're conscious, but they're not. They're just thinking and breathing and eating and crapping, but they're not conscious. What is being conscious? Let's let's frame that in another uh, the question. Let's put it differently. Like, what is consciousness? Would be better, easier than before we get into what is being consciousness, which is an ontological question, right? We get into just the definitional question of what is consciousness. Then we can talk about being consciousness or not. Okay, we spoke about what consciousness is. What is consciousness? Consciousness is the source of life. Consciousness is the creative. Consciousness is the real. It's what animates this world. Conscious, without life, there, without consciousness, there is no life. It's, it's the, uh, the substrate. I, 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 let's see, how else can I put? Uh, oh, co consciousness is that which is required for qualia, for, for actually tasting the, the apple of an apple or, the, or, or seeing the orange of an orange right? Or smelling the smell of sandalwood or whatever. Consciousness is that by which those things are possible. Without those, without consciousness, those things don't occur. And the same thing is true for life. Without consciousness, there is no life. So you've, so 
now that's saying consciousness is both the source of those things and the method by which they're experienced and by which they exist at all the notion of the notion of of of, of uh, fragrance requires consciousness yeah so does that mean that suggests i would think that fragrance itself or a water bottle itself is also consciousness why do you think that i mean this does not taste my lips but i taste it what's it made of uh water what's water made of Well, it depends on whom you ask. You could say it's made of wetness. You could say it's made of hydrogen and oxygen. You could say it's made of, of you know, two hydrogens, one oxygen. You could say it's made of subatomic particles. That's a that's a, a deep physical question, which I'd be happy to talk about, but it's it's getting off the the, the way here. Let's return to consciousness. Consciousness is the source of everything. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it, right? Like the spoiler of a movie, right? And so it, in a way, I'd kind of like to deal with the panpsychism or, or this AI stuff. But, but if we're going to go real broad, then yeah, consciousness is what makes this uh, universe okay, possible. Okay, so then what is being conscious? If somebody else, you say somebody It's being else, alive. Being alive. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, it's being alive, consciousness. But then you said some people aren't conscious, they're just eating, crapping, talking. They're not alive. That's not being alive? Doing well, I mean, things. okay, again, we're, you're going into hypotheticals. Like some people, that doesn't help, right? Okay. I could take a corpse. Who's dragging this corpse around? That's consciousness. Consciousness is dragging the body around. This one. But I didn't say body, I said corpse. Why do you make that distinction? Because without consciousness, this is the corpse that's being dragged around. I mean, without consciousness, it is, it's a corpse. That's why I don't say body. I and mean, you know, and this, this formulation is not something new. That comes from like the seventh century Zen. Yeah. Eighth century, ninth century. Chan is what it's called, by the way. So all of these things have been worked out and they've been studied very, very hard. And, they, and, and they, they're, they're quite rigorous and they're quite clear. But it, in the West, we've just ignored it all because of our bigotry and our prejudice against religion and spirit or whatever, you, however you want to call it. But we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater and now the baby's climbed up the stairs and it's come to bite us, right? So now, at least, if, as the baby's coming up the stairs with these sharp teeth, it's time to say, hey, wait a minute. Maybe we shouldn't have thrown the baby out. We should have studied the baby as well, right? Not just focused on the bathwater for like 300 years. What's the difference between a person who's just walking around eating and whatnot and a person who's actually conscious? The, the, now we got two hypotheticals. Is everyone on the same level of experiencing consciousness? No, absolutely not. Some people are, might as well be, you know, dead. Their souls are dead. They're on auto autopilot. Tell me about that. What is the difference in these people's experience of consciousness? Have you spent any time with any like federal level politicians? No. Okay, they're they're kind of on a they're they're kind of like a they're on a, like a program, and they go through the motions like oh isn't that sweet and they hug the baby or they say the the right thing or whatever, but it's it's all it's all like rehearsed. It's 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 a program. Now I'm not saying that they're completely unconscious because obviously they can taste a a two thousand dollar bottle of wine and distinguish it I suppose from a, from Ripple. You know, so they're not totally unconscious, but 
but they're they're very close to it. There, there's no, or another example would be kids. And now here I'm getting, oh boy, kids who've been raised in the ghetto and who have had not parents at all and who have lived in complete violent and hostile and very very dangerous circumstances their entire life. Sometimes when you bring them in for an examination, like or when I'm in the in the prisons and I'm having to examine them because they've just been brought in, there's no there there. There's no one home. They're just conditioning. Right. So the, but that's not being very that's not helping our, our situation of trying to understand this more. But I should point out that that you can you can beat or, or neglect or condition or reward a, a an organism like a human to the extent that there there's no there there left. They're just going completely on conditioning. Right. And this happens. Is that not like an, an AI that's not alive? No, 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 no. I, I, I veered off into a little bit of, of uh, something else. Let's go back to the rigorous question. Now, so now let's go complete rigor. Ask the question again. Is somebody running through the motions completely conditioned akin to an AI? Yeah, it's closer to, an, closer to a program than it is to a creative living human being. So creativity is a feature of, of consciousness. It, it's, look at the world. It's, it's constantly creating. And, and so and people think they're very proud of their thought. They think that they've really thought of something themselves. Well, that's silly. You know, if you just look at it, people don't have original thoughts. They combine other thoughts, right? The thought, where, and, and they have no idea where thought comes from. That's another problem that modern science and psychology and, and, uh, and philosophy have. Where does thought come from? What is it made of? And I would love for somebody to say something, but they're so uh, baffled, I guess, is a polite way to put it, polite way to put it, that, that no progress has been made. You could argue we've gone backwards. So I'd like to pin that down. Okay. Somebody, an AI and somebody who's just running through the motions on a program, they are lacking in this creativity that comes from consciousness. Say it again, please. An AI that's not alive mm -hmm. lacks creativity. Yes. All I can do is combine things. Same thing for a human, same thing for a human. Now, so for here, for creativity, the best is David Deutsch. Creativity is not that simple, folks. It's not like, oh, my gut told me this, or, oh, I, I, I did Mickey Mouse with blue and white stripes instead of black ears. That's not creativity. That's just mixing and matching. Those are just neural nets doing probabilities and things like that. So creativity is totally different than that. And that's a complex subject, and it's been well treated by David Deutsch, I got to say. David Deutsch, Beginning of Infinity, and he had a book before that. David Deutsch, by the way, for those of you who don't know, he's the uh, he's called the father of quantum computing, and he wrote two very seminal and beautiful books, very similar to each other, but might as well read the later one, I suppose. And and, and he talks about creativity, what's meant by creativity, and other people have struggled with this as well. Noam Chomsky, uh, but his has to do with language, I believe, and I may be misstating that altogether. Uh, but yeah, creativity is something that we really need to look at as well. Yeah. How could a machine be creative? Think about it. How could a machine be creative? How, how could it create? What can it do more than mix and match numbers and zeros and ones and, and arbitrary uh, constructs or concepts in its own like, yeah, and see, that's feeble, actually. And so people will want to include life. Well, I mean, I think, okay, I guess I haven't read David Deutsch's treatment of creativity or much about creativity in general, but I... It's a whole other topic, a huge, beautiful, gorgeous topic. And what's called creativity, I would not use that word for that. Just like I would not use being alert for the same thing as consciousness. They're, they're, they're different domains. So no worries. I mean, people have been struggling with this for, like, like I say, 300 years. And what's happened is that we've ignored... Uh, didn't I send out a tweet that, that we've decided that if it came from the Middle East or from the East, 
then it must be inferior to what we've got. And so we, we never even tried it. We never even studied it. And so now we're ignorant. And we need it now, right? So what do the Middle East and East have that we have ignored? They have an understanding of consciousness. Now I'm saying I'm using the word East and Middle Eastern and, and, and uh, it's not just those, that, but native peoples everywhere have had some peoples among them that understood what, what we're talking about here. But we don't have no use for, for shamans or naguals or, or, or uh, experiential philosophers or, or mystics or, or, you know, we have a bunch of words, most of them pejorative in the, from the point of view of the, of the modern West and science. But those days are up, folks. You had your day, you had your day, and, and now you're, you're, you're at lost at sea because you, you were too, too bigoted in the sense that you were too narrow minded. You excluded things that did not fit in with your worldview. So, you know, so when, so, so materialism had died a hard death, and a lot of people are still hung up on it. It's really quite extraordinary. They still believe that there's little bitty, even though they know there's not these little teeny, teeny, little bitty atoms like Democritus and, and the Indian philosophers and so on and so forth believed in. These guys are still holding on to that kind of barbaric thought. So it would be, so then I'd like to refer to the traditions as opposed to just the Eastern Middle East. The Sufis, Kabbalah, Gnostics, Toltecs, Olmecs, what do they have in this understanding of consciousness that we've overlooked? The traditions, depending on how you define traditions, for example, the Christians had to hide out. They had, they, you couldn't get up and say, hey, uh, I know God, or, or worse. Like Jesus said, I am God. You get crucified. Uh, and, and yeah, something like that. So reframe the question again and not don't don't list all these others because then I have to go, well, wait a minute. Is that a tradition he's talking about or is he talking about some myth, you know, about the old Mac or something like that? So, so keep it simple and let, let's take it step by step. Okay. You claim some people have a better knowledge of consciousness that we've overlooked in the West, largely. I claim that they ha they know what consciousness is and the others don't, full stop. Okay, what has given them the ability to know what consciousness is while the rest of us are floundering? <sighs> it's mysterious why some people are able to clear away the clouds and see the sun, right, or the moon directly. But this has been true of every culture that I know of. And certainly at the core of every religious impulse, there is this person or persons who understand, right? Now they typically are persecuted, they're hurt, they're, they're killed, they're, they're burned at the stake or martyred. I mean, you look at the history of the Catholic Church, there's martyrs all, out, all over the place, burned at the stake for a heresy. Right, and the same thing's true in, in Islam, and the same thing's true in, in, in you know, and in other places, people they're smart enough not to raise their heads to get chopped off by the religious authorities. Now, religion's been decimated, and but we have a new religion rising up, and that's the religion of the of the hardcore. They call themselves rationalists, but they're not rational, or the hardcore scientists, but they're not real scientists. Or the, the materialists who believe that, look, if you talk like something like that, we're going to boot you. We're, we don't allow dissent among our myths, right? We're, we're, the only way to approach consciousness is the way we do it. And they're wrong. You know, what can I say? They're wrong. Wrong. You know, and so it's, but the thing is, that's been going on for a long, long time. And everybody just kind of looks and says, well, yeah, who cares? It doesn't, doesn't matter. And the, the guys who know what consciousness is, typically they're not interested in fame particularly, why would they be? If you got truth, why would you want fame? And all of its attendant, you know, problems. So they just keep to themselves. And they, occasionally they'll speak up and they'll get burned at the state or they'll get kicked out of the university. So it's that, that's a current state of affairs. 
So somebody who really wants to learn what consciousness is mm -hmm. can they learn from these people who know from these actual experts not the academia but the actual experts of consciousness depending on their character depending on how deeply conditioned they are depending how, how prone they are to intellectualization yeah there's a possibility that they can learn but for for most people it takes work for other people it doesn't take work it's easier for women for example but basically what we have is that the intellect and our th conceptual thought is basically like clouds in the sky blocking the sun and so if you you need flexibility of mind and you need humility and you need and that's the thing that's in the shortest supply is humility you need real humility you need effort you need patience you need to do the work, right, of, of disassembling this and, and making your, 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 your apparatus capable of seeing what's right in front of your face, right? It's the most obvious thing in the world, right? And then you've got the issue, other issues of, of like trying to not, a lot of people will fall over the minute they discover that, they go bonkers and, and realize, hey, it's, everything's open, everything's free, everything, you know, I can do anything I want. And they do. They go and like, like Osho. I think that guy. He he like gets a bunch of Bentleys and forms a big ashram. But he got, you know he ended up in prison. And I'm not saying he's a good example of a good human being, and certainly no saint or anything like that. But it doesn't require sainthood. It requires clarity. So I don't know how what. And I, I hate to bring his name up because he's an example of the kind of thing that gives the whole enterprise a bad name but this is not a new enterprise this has been a long, around since the beginning of time now when you say Sufi do you mean Jewish or do you mean Muslim Christian I mean this impulse the Sufic impulse predates all of these but right, that's important for people to know that religion is built on top of this this is not what not the other way around mm -hmm. For example, people get confused. They think Taoism, oh, that's a Chinese, a Chinese thing. No. The Chinese civilization did not produce Taoism. Taoism produced the Chinese civilization. Just think about it. We're, we're wandering around like beasts, right? We don't know how to farm. We don't know how to build. We don't know, how, we don't know squat from irrigation and, and all these things. And then all of a sudden, boom. There's a, a vast improvement in all of these things at once. There's 80 years of Greece in which they, they went from living with sticks and tiles, you know, boards, wooden boards, to building the most exquisite architecture. It's never been surpassed. And we see this in Egypt. We see this in Greece. We see this in other parts of the world. These are the ones that the Westerners are most familiar with. So do you think this just happened by accident? And do you think there was no communication between Egypt and Greece or uh, India and, and uh, China or Greece and India along the Silk Road? This is all known to people, but except for the ones who at the moment need it most. Because they're about to create something that's going to uh, change this world irrevocably and create untold suffering in addition to what they've already created, right? And it can be avoided if we're, we're thoughtful and careful. And we get to have our AIs too. Now, if I was in a, in a, a, a Western uh, literature course or civics course or something like that we, we've seen this thing this this motif think about frankenstein the motif of frankenstein or think of the golden head or think of there's there's uh, all of our history is full of these kinds of examples of what happens when you start to mess with nature too much right and so that's the reason for trying to raise a, a, a warning flag and say you know we got to be careful here folks let me hit this bell now and then if we could take the follow up afterwards. Okay.